what is going on comic fam it's your boy the bearded comic bro and i am joined by tom bryfogel welcome to the show how's it going thanks for having me man it's great i'm excited um you have a new comic coming out um how i became a shoplifter we're going to talk about that i'm I read it. It's fantastic, gang. Um, and if you watch my show, you know I don't jump off right off the bat and say that unless I mean it. Um, but before we hop into your book, I got to ask you, have you always had a love for comics or is this kind of a newfound love for you? So it's interesting. I, I had a love very briefly, then it went away and then it came back. So like in seventh grade, I bought some random X-Men ripoff book. I, I don't even know what the book was. It was a very 90s it's probably an image book. I don't know what it was, but it was also like number 40. So I had no idea what was going on. So I was like, okay, but I was inspired enough where then in study hall in seventh grade, I started drawing my own comics and I drew my first comic was uh, me. I was Freddy Krueger's son. I was Tom Krueger and me and Freddy Krueger went around killing people. And uh, there's an homage to that comic in how I became a shoplifter. But then in that same year in seventh grade, I went to a Green Day concert where they, at the end of the show, destroyed all of their equipment. And I, I mean, I liked their music, but them destroying their equi equipment and Trey Cole lit his drum set on fire. I was just <laughs> like, all right, everything, no more comics, no more nothing. I'm just focusing on music and only music. And that's kind of what I did. And then many years later, like 20 years later, 17 years later, I realized I had no hobbies that weren't music related. Mm. Like any hobby I had, I really got into orchestrating for a bit, got into playing more bass instead of drums, like things like that. And then, so my new year's resolution in 2014 was to get some sort of hobby that's not music. And then uh, like by the very end of the year, I, I picked comic books and started reading comic books. And then within a few months after that, uh, I rewatched, American Splendor, which is a movie I, I've always really loved. So good. And there's the scene where Harvey Pekar is drawing stick figures. And I was like, oh, I can do that. Oh. And then so for a few years, I didn't write scripts. I wrote comics with stick figures. And then uh, I released music occasionally from the name Birds in the Airport. And one of my music videos, uh, I hired a comic book artist. And um, that was the first time I worked with a comic book artist. And then I was hooked. I was like, this is awesome. This is, uh, I was very used to with birds in the airport. I very used to making it by myself and just like spending unlimited hours by myself doing it. And I really enjoyed working a long time on the script and then sending it off and having someone else actually work on it. Yeah. That's so cool. Like, I mean, I feel like a lot of us who got in the comic books, we have this kind of point where we fell out for whatever reason, you know, music, girls, sports, you know, whatever, um, and it's just interesting to hear, you know, people's origin story of how, and, you know, you seem like you were always kind of wanting dabbling in writing and drawing and, you know, it was always there at the forefront. So, you know, it sounds like you had this decision, like, I want to get back into comics. What were, do you have any memories of what some of the comics you're like, man, these are, these are ones that resonated when you got back into it. Oh, for sure. Uh, Rachel Rising was amazing. A friend of mine, his name's Sean, he recommended so many indie books. I had no knowledge of indie books uh, at that point. Uh, and he was Rachel Rising, Lady Killer, uh, Why the Last Man, Great. then uh, a non indie book, Howard the Duck, came out in 2015, the Chip Zdarsky. Yep. yep. But that one I loved. That one like really resonated with me. That was the first like Marvel book I really loved. And um, yeah, and also I've read um batman nightfall from the 90s i bought yes. all three of those and the artist on a lot of that uh, his name's norm breifogel he's like a distant he's not alive anymore now he was alive them distant yeah. long uh cousin of mine of some sorts i'm told anyone with my last name were related in some <laughs> way and he snuck uh my last name his last name all over the book so it was kind of trippy to um that was the first book i got when i was like yeah. i'm gonna get into comics was nightfall and like every graveyard scene there's a Bryfogel on the grave every like game show scene there's a Bryfogel on the show so mm -hmm. that was kind of interesting yeah that's cool now I'm going to now I'm going to go reread my I have a massive the like yeah, thick, yeah, yeah. yeah and I'm going to go back and read. I'm like uh now I'm always going to see your name everywhere so it's going <laughs> to resonate <laughs> so you got into you got into writing and you know and getting back into the hobby where was it, though, that you're like, OK, I want to start to create comic books now that you got back into the hobby? 
it was pretty quick, uh, like the stick figure comics, but I wasn't yeah. taking it seriously. It was just a creative exercise pretty much. And those were all stories. Hopefully one day I will make a book out of it. Um, um, it was all just stories of, I was on tour from 2002 to 2017 and this would have been in 2015. So still on tour, I was just writing wacky stories that had happened to me on tour with no care. It's like a 10 page story and then another 10 page story. And then in 2016, I wrote a comic, which I do want to get back to at one point with the, the, I started it with an artist. Then we went separate ways, started it with another art team. I wrote seven issues for it. We had some beginner's luck where we almost got a publishing deal. And then that didn't happen. And then certain artists were too busy to work on future projects. And then that's when I, uh, I started writing a book called Father Figure, and father figure had a bunch of flashbacks and the flashbacks were him as a kid committing crimes. And then all of those flashbacks ended up being how I became a shoplifter. Father figure is still going to come out like in a year and a half. Okay. But without the flashbacks. Nice. So it'll be tied into this. Well, let's jump into talking about how I became a shoplifter. How I became a shoplifter, a year by year look at the final generation of juvenile delinquents before social media and smartphones took over our lives. Phil and Mitch are two ordinary suburban kids who will break any law, big or small, to get revenge on bullies and, you know, hopefully impress some girls at school in the process. Take a nostalgic trip back to the 90s and early 2000s with 11 hilarious chapters drawn by 11 incredible art teams. Will our heroes survive high school without being thrown in prison or ending up dead? Find out in How I Became a Shoplifter. What, first off, what's the premise about? It's about the, the last generation of teenagers before there were security cameras everywhere and before social media and before teenagers had cell phones, just the final generation where you could commit petty crimes and get away with it. And it's about two kids. Every story is uh, based in a different year. So you see them grow up uh, from 12 to 20. And then pretty much the whole story, it's them using crime to their benefit, either to impress some girls or to get revenge on bullies. Yeah. So cool. And I remember, um, I remember just seeing it and like the concept and getting to dig into it is such a unique aspect because it's, they're short stories that tie together and you start to get to know the characters, but you could easily read them out of order. I feel like, and still get to know because they're just such unique stories. And, I've got to ask, like, how how did you process this idea of like, OK, you know, you wanted to create these characters who were doing things before the age of social media and tech. But like these ideas for these stories, some of these are bonkers. Like, are they just like, how is your process for writing and creating something like that? They're very exaggerated versions of uh, stories that did happen, but very like they're fiction. It's fictional. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's mainly all inspired from something that happened like there's one story where there is like a heist at a restaurant like I worked at a restaurant but there was no heist so I don't know like that yeah yeah no it's cool like and so like it almost seems like you're put you're getting the basis of your idea from like real life and you're like okay now I want to amplify it <laughs> totally and like there's one story I won't like give it away what happens in the book, but uh, the two characters are trying to get Smash Mouth's autographs. They're called Mash Mouth in, in the book. And uh, that is a true story, not what you see on the page, but I did sneak backstage at a Smash Mouth concert and did get autographs for a girl. I, I succeeded in, in the book. They don't succeed. I'll spoil that. But yeah, that part was true. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love it. Well, What's so interesting, um, I want to get to the art team here eventually because it, art's great, but you, there is so much pop culture mm. in this book. Like, you know, the very first issue, if you go into the, you're in the boy's room, and I mean, there is holy trip down nostalgia lane of movie posters after movie posters that I feel like are slightly off, so you don't, but like, 
it's like you're looking at you've got your clerks you've got everything in the background like it's like and then like band posters and you know music seems to be running so much through for you so like why was why was pop culture and music such a you know you mentioned the smash mouth story and you know, like why is that such a you know a heavy thread line throughout these stories i guess that was just pulling from truth that was a lot of the stuff in those rooms were posters on my wall as a kid and a lot of the stuff that was just making it time stamping it and making it authentic especially some of like the random posters like were the posters on my walls um but yeah, I guess music's always been in my life. And it's and at that point in my life, as a teenager, it was definitely the most important thing in my life. It was like I knew so much about every band, knew every band member's name. Like, I, I'm not like that at all. And I still love music. But like, I was in, in it to win it. I was just like obsessed with music. And that's what my friends and I, it's all we talked about. We just went to concerts all the time. And uh yeah, it was fun to put so many different bands in different ways. Like even like the chapter pages, each this is more a subliminal one. Like when it says like chapter one, chapter two, those are all different band uh, typesets, band fonts. Oh, so nice. each one, yeah, th that's like a deep, there's an Operation Ivy one, a Goldfinger one. Those are more of the deep cuts of uh, band references, subliminal ones. But um, yeah, yeah, it was just. I mean, it's it was so fun to go through. And I'm like, once I saw it on the first panel, then I was looking for it everywhere. I was <laughs> like, I was like, oh my gosh, like what a great childhood. <laughs> because, like if they were like, because I was like, man, I love that movie. I love that band. Like, and it was some there's something about it, right? Of the age where, you know, I remember sitting around in the room and we'd pull out the cassette tapes to see the lyrics or the CD sleeves, and we'd be studying the lyrics so we could memorize the words and know the songs. And, like, it's, it was just a different time. Oh, for sure. And it was fun. A lot of the artists uh, I worked with are, like, 10 years younger than me, and a lot of them didn't grow up in the States, so some of them have no idea who these deep cut bands are so it was like scouring the internet to get references for some of the posters or anything like that it was a lot of fun it was um yeah it was a trip down it was like reliving the 90 late 90s and early 2000s so let's talk about you mentioned the art team and um holy buckets the art in this book is fantastic and i, I don't say that lightly because i get i get requests to like hey you know you know, you want to talk about the book or Kickstarter or whatever. And art is one that I gravitate towards often. Cause I don't, yeah, I can, I can pick up a synopsis and understand, but you don't get a taste of the actual writing. But like, as I scanned through, I was like, I looked at the art right away and I was like, I'm here for it. Um, you got a great team. How did that art team come about? It was many years. This book I've been working on. I wrote father figure early 2018 so these stories started then the art for this book started in early 2019 so it's been going for a very long time it has yeah. been uh all over the place for how i found the different artists some of them like daniel hilliard and jordy perez i contacted them to be the artist on father figure and they couldn't commit to like a 120 page story and then like a year later uh ask them if they could do a five page story 10 page story and they were down just i guess we uh, knew each other from the year before and like Davide Pupo or Jimmy Kutsai met them at C2E2 and the colorist like Antonio Fabella he uh, he colored a book called Skyward uh, on Image Comics about wow. four or five years ago it's one of my favorite I was just like who's your favorite colorist in the world okay let me contact him same thing with Dijo Lima who passed away early this year it's crazy I've been working on this book so long it's like people have died while making it yeah people it's been insane, but, uh, and then with letterers, it's just every letterer on the book is are one of my favorite letterers working in comics. So it was just hitting up my favorite letterers. Yeah. Well, and, uh, a good, and one of them is Hassan who oh, yeah. is fantastic letterer, like, and is on every book. It seems yeah. like so, um, the, yeah, the creative team getting together was, was just dynamite and they it, you know they all have the unique styles i think when it comes to the art but it just flows so well and it helps it helps tell the story in a way that, like you said you're going through different aspects and different parts and so totally yeah it was cool um because i wanted to have a continuity but obviously every artist is going to look a little different but right. 
I thought it was cool because you do looking at old pictures or something, you do look different every year when you're growing up. Yeah. So that's what based that off. So yeah, it was it was so, cool. So when can you know we haven't talked about like how can people check out this book? When's it coming out? You know, how's it coming out? So people can, you know, start to prep for it. Issue one is coming out January 23rd, uh, 2023, uh, via Sumerian Comics. So it'll be in all comic book shops. Issue two will be in February. Issue three will be in March. And then after that, the trade will be in normal bookstores, Amazon, and comic stores. Nice. So it's so that's just the first three stories. Um, it's what, um, And then do you have more that you want in the world? Or is this oh, gonna... issue? Issue one will be the prologue in the first three chapters. Then okay. issue two four or five and six okay issue gotcha. three seven eight nine and then the trade will have the epilogue gotcha okay it'll have a oh, cool so that makes sense for how it's going gang i'm telling you check it out and and you said uh sumerian that they used to be behemoth correct they did yeah when i first started talking to them they were behemoth okay so yeah i've had i've had those guys on i've had a lot of creators on so it's cool to uh you know to see now that kind of transition a little bit and would it fits so well with the company because they are so tied to music as well. And this book, like I said, it just music flows out of it. You know, you as a musician and um, it, it couldn't be a more perfect pairing for a publisher and a comic in my mind. I agree. Like I had been submitting it to so many publishers and I, I was going to go with a different publisher. And then I discovered behemoth discovered blackout and discovered cinnamon and then I was like, oh, who is this? Like, it just made so much sense. And then at that point, the book was completely done. So, and like the movie trailer for the book was done. Everything was done. So I just sent it. Uh, they had submissions at that time, sent a fully completed, like 120 page book with a trailer and everything. And within like 10 minutes, they were like, hell yeah, let's do this. And then I was like, awesome, let's do this. That's it's funny. Like you mentioned blackout. I'm like I got blackout there. Cinnamon was one of my favorite books last year. Uh, just the concept, like uh, Victoria Douglas, fantastic work. Like such a, I'm loving. I'm loving the unique stories that are coming out of Behemoth now, Sumerian, and uh, so I, I love seeing that it's you know just a beautiful marriage of uh, your comic and that company. Yeah, I'm excited about it and. I think I'm going to release music with the comic too. I'm not sure. Um, still got to figure that out. The music's done for Birds in the Airport. Yeah, but I want to put out some music. Uh, when I signed with them, it wasn't a record label, but now they merged with Sumerian, which is also a record label. So we'll figure that out. But either so way. It, it's something of like, you know, like that kind of ties along with the comic that you're working. Um, you said Birds in the Airport is, is that? Yeah, is that's that? the name of the project. Okay. It's more just new Birds in the Airport. Okay. Not too much. Yeah. I did write a song called How I Became a Shoplifter, but nah, it wasn't as good as just normal songs. <laughs> nice. <laughs> what is the process for you of writing music and writing comic? Is it similar or is it or is it a different aspect because of the style of art they are? It, it's very similar. The most uh the, the biggest similarity is knowing when something's done and knowing when something's good. I know good is subjective, but when you're like, yeah. oh, this is like having that feeling. And then I guess when you start with comics and with music, I guess, I mean, the first time I ever got art back, like I thought it was so great. And then I remember going to a Comic-Con and showing it to people and they would like look at it for two seconds and like be done with it. I'm like, oh, whoa, okay. Like uh, it's not as good as I thought it was. I better uh, step this up somehow. Mm. Same thing with, with music. I guess with art, it's immediate. They can look at it and anyone can. You can look at a piece of art in like two seconds and know if it's up to what you want or not. And um, I guess with music, you have to listen to the, the three minute song. So knowing the feeling, like getting the, the goosebumps or getting like the like, oh, this is right. But with music, I feel like I get I'm I'm someone who normally produces my own songs. So I normally if I get excited about something, I start jumping the gun and start orchestrating it or start producing it, start making the drum track for it. Where with comics, I'm not that good of an artist. So I have to have it finished and then have the artist do it. So it's more like in music, I have to be more disciplined to make sure the song is awesome before starting to make it the fun part of actually making it sound like a song. Where in comics, yeah, I just it just I know if I hand it undercooked to an artist, it's not going to be great. Right. So it, it almost is a unique aspect of 
uh, where, you know, it sounds like, you know, with your music, you're able to, you do so much. You're so you know, talented on music that you can create it all in your own kind of bubble to a degree that then now you have to bring in other creators though, like, and figure out what's the process of working alongside others when it comes to the comic aspect and, you know, adding the art, adding the letters and stuff like that. And, totally. And this was a crazy process dealing with like not dealing with working with like 30 artists like it was yeah. pretty awesome it was cool to um yeah yeah every person's different and everybody works differently and it was an amazing process to go through that and just uh yeah some people their layouts almost look like a finished product some people the layouts like i can barely tell what's going on but you you figure it out and and then i'm proud of every story in the book yeah well and Again, like the stories, I think why I, I appreciate it so much is like I resonate with the stories. And again, to a degree, like there are stuff where I'm like, when you read some of these stories, you're like, guys, I don't resonate. I did that never happened in my life. I didn't. Do, but like, you know, the stuff of dealing with the bullies or, you know, finding an escapism, you know, in music or the stupid things we would do for to try to impress people. And things. I'm just like. It it was done in such a way where I'm just like, this hits me in, you know, in like, I can relate to this. And then you throw in the, I mean, the era of music and, you know, the pop culture reference. I'm like, yes, I'm here for it. <laughs> nice. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, I think it's like a comedy book, but there aren't many jokes. It's more just like what's going on what is i guess obnoxious and extreme but a lot of that was going on in the 90s and early 2000s when people were just hanging out without being supervised all the time right i mean <laughs> my wife and i just watched the woodstock 99 documentary oh, yeah <laughs> and you're like whoa what that actually happened <laughs> yeah so i like, watched the new one i watched one like a year ago but yeah that's pretty dark I think there there's like two out. I think there's like one on HBO and one on Netflix. I think we watched the Netflix one and we're just like sitting there going like, Oh wow. Like, yeah. Like, you know, cause we go to music festivals all the time now, which is not any of our experiences, <laughs> nothing like that. And so it was just like, um, it's so cool though to see. Um, I think we're seeing a lot more now with music tying into comics of, you know, the fact that a, we're talking about is being published by a Sumerian who is a, you know, record company that bought a, you know, comics and company. And you, you're seeing this aspect of, you know, one of my favorite comics last year was um, Nottingham from Mad Cave. And the artist is uh, a lead singer of a, a rock band in Canada. Like, it's just like, you're seeing the, and to see how much it ties in with each other and stuff like that. It's just cool to see how unique and different art forms form together, but you can still tell a story in different ways. Totally. And how I became a shoplifter slash father figure are two of, I don't know, like seven sort of comics I've been writing. Mm -hmm. Every other one almost involves a band where there's QR codes where you can hear the band. And um, yeah, I've been pitching a lot of different comics for a long time. So yeah, they're all, I like to write about people in bands or, or musicians in general. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. To, that's awesome to hear. So, you know, we, we talked a lot about this um, and I know you said father figures, this kind of birthed out of father figures. Um, yes. And so we're going to get to see more of that, this world through father figures. Is this also, is this another world you want to spend more time with the characters that you created with how I want to be a shoplifter in different, you know, tell more backstories like that. Or is this kind of like, no, this is a one and done for their backstory kind of stuff. It, it Yeah, I am making, I want every series I make. Uh, I, I don't want you to have pre have to pre-read the other material. Yeah. Father figure, you don't need to read How I Became a Shoplifter at all. It'll make sense. It's its own story. It's the main character, Phil. He's 35 in Father Figure. Mm. And yeah, it's more like Robin Hood meets uh, Reservoir Dogs. It's like steal from the rich, give to the poor. Steal from the corrupt and give yeah. to the poor more than steal from the rich. And then I have another book called Generation Numb where um, Phil is a very small character in it, but he makes some important decisions. And he's like in his 20s. And that, that one's based in 2008. And that one's about a girl in a band called Generation Numb. And that's the one I just finished writing that one about four months ago. 
uh, I guess every songwriter, every writer, they think their last thing they did is the best thing they've ever done. I think that's the best thing I've ever done so far. Nice. But uh, so it won't come out for three years or so. But uh, yeah, no, no art, uh, no artist is attached to it or anything at this yeah. point. If you don't mind me just asking and indulging, you know, the process of creating comic books, I feel and I could be wrong. It feels like it's a it's a little bit longer to get the results back of what fans think than it is with music from the idea of uh, like, I don't know. Is there, is there, um, I feel like when you're playing at a concert or something, you get instant reaction from people of if they're singing along, they like your music or stuff. Like how is that different from writing a comic? Cause like you said, you've been working on this since 2018 and we're talking about it's dropping in 2003, 23, like, yeah. That's a long time to be pouring your heart and soul into something and to be like, are people going to like this or, you know? Yeah. I, I don't have many friends who are into comic books. I wish I had more. I haven't heard much feedback at all. So yeah, this is, uh, I'm very excited for it to come out. I'm proud of all of it, but uh, yeah, when I wrote it, uh, my wife and I moved to Nashville for a few years. That's where most of this was written. Uh, we're, we live in California now. We lived in California before and after, but when most of this was written was there and I, I would like show it to people like when the art was coming in and people would be like, Oh, that's cool and stuff. But like most of those people weren't into comic books or would never like read the entire book or maybe they will now. Right. But yeah, it's way different with a song. You can email someone a song and they can put it on. Hopefully you're hoping they listen to it with intent, but they could just put it on in the background and be like, yeah, that was cool with the comic. You actually have to read it and sit there. Yeah. That's it's, it's, it's such a, that's why I love talking about, comics with creators because it is you have to have a love for it like you have to have a passion for it because it is it's a long process and you know and to, you know like you said like it's a lot of work to then say i hope you guys like it and <laughs> so yeah and it was cool working that was one thing with how i became a shoplifter there would be working with like three or four art teams at a time which was a lot of emails to be yeah. sending out but it was that was cool. So like if on five page stories, they could all be doing it separate times or like a bigger colorist like Antonio Fabella, like he's all he's doing stuff for Marvel and Image all the time. I believe he had like a month per page was the deadline. So it's like that's how you can get these incredible artists mm. to uh, to do something for at the time it was an unpublished, but like there was no publisher involved at all during the creation until we got to the cover art. Oh, wow. Wow. So that again, you know, to create something to have the art team and creative team that you have on it without the backing of a publisher. Like it's insane. And it's, I just, I'm so excited for this to come out because I think people are going to, I think people are going to talk about it and be like, this is a lot of fun to read. Thanks. So, well, Tom, I want to respect your time. I know you're busy. Where can people follow along with, you know, are you, I, I know you've talked about some of yourself. Uh, you, you're writing a lot and this is coming out and you've got some more stuff coming out. So where can people follow along with you with um, what you're creating and how they can, you know, stay up to date with everything? Cause you're a busy person. <laughs> yeah. You can on Instagram. That's where I'm most active. Just okay. tom.bryfogel.comics. Or if you just search Tom Bry Fogel, uh, you'll, you'll find the one that says comics. That's the one that I'm most active on. As far as I have a newsletter being set up, I have a list going. I haven't started mailing it out. I'm about to soon. You can go to TomRifleGo.com or TomWritesComics.com because my last name is confusing. So if you just, uh, either of those takes you to the same place to sign up for a mailing list, which I will start uh, utilizing that. Nice. So gang, Instagram. Um, if you have listened to this interview uh, you know, on the podcast or you're watching this and you're like, man, this is something like it's in previews now, right? On, yeah. on your shop. So like you can, no matter whether it's up to like talk to your LCS, say, look, I want to check this out. Um, gang, I think, you know me, if you watch the show, you know me, I, if I like it, I'm going to hype it up and talk about, it. and this is what I'm going to hype up and talk about. So. <laughs> thanks yeah and there's seven different covers for issue one seven is... different covers holy <laughs> yeah. buckets are they man that's insane i'm so i'm so excited though <laughs> yeah juan Cavia. he that was one of the people he uh the ballad for sophie was one of my favorite books of the last few years and it was just a cold call just like hey man i love your art 
would you be interested? And he was like, yeah, he did two covers. He did one for issue one and one for issue two. And then a lot of the artists who worked on the book also, also did covers. And uh, yeah, it was uh, just got the final cover for issue three. So all the covers are done now um, from Osgur, Osgur Yildirim. He does like uh, Kick-Ass. He does Kingsman. Okay. It's, I'm excited for the world to see that one when uh, issue three is announced. Yeah. And gang, if you want to kind of get sneak peeks of stuff that we're talking about, go to Tom's Instagram because it's loaded with with pics of panels and and things like that like you you share out a lot of this comic that people can check out and see like is this something that i'm interested in totally i try to leave context out of it i try to not ruin anything but just show cool art so tom thank you so much just for taking some time out of your schedule to talk about comics with me and music and it's just it's been a, a blast of course thank you gregory this is awesome yeah awesome gang so again check out uh how i became a shoplifter coming out uh january you said what january 20 january 23rd or no 23rd. no january 18th 23 18th. all right uh, yeah. some comics gang talk to your lcs get it on your poll check it out with that being said hopefully you can find some time to curl up grab a book and nerd out peace